All right, boys. What a day. Oh, my gosh. It was the biggest day I can remember on the dojo. I don't think we've ever had a bigger day on the dojo. We had so much fun. Uh, obviously, what I'm talking about is the uh, release of this right here, the Whiskey Rebellion. This bad boy, we, we started work on this project a year ago when uh, Skip came to me in uh, New Orleans and said he had a great idea for a cigar to do, and he wanted to do it with us. And we couldn't have been more excited about doing it with Skip because we love all, all the Romacraft stuff. And so finally, after a year of work, these things take time. If you want to do something good, these things take time. And today was the big day. And so we had uh, 500 boxes of these guys. And some got held back for the show tonight. Uh, there's a event in uh, a famous there in Pennsylvania. And so, uh, but other than that, other than a few they held back for the show, we sold the entire amount in 64 minutes. And it was wild and wooly and fun. We had a great time. And so, uh, so tonight we thought, hey, let's bring Skip on the show. We'll talk about this project. We'll talk about uh, the cigar. We'll talk about the Whiskey Rebellion, what it all means, why it's named that, a little bit about everything. And then maybe we'll talk about just some cigar stuff that's coming up uh, with Roma Craft and with just the cigar, the cigar biz in general. So, uh, so it should be a fun show. We normally don't do Thursday nights, but since the uh, release was today, we thought it would be apropos to uh, have the show tonight. So that's what we're going to do. And hey, guys, contest is going great. Uh, hashtag rebel. So uh, you just post on the dojo uh, what you would do to fight for your rights as if you were a rebel. And uh, we're going to pick the winners on Saturday. So you can post your entries all through tonight. We're going to share some entries tonight. We're not going to pick any winners, but we're going to share some entries tonight. And, and then uh, you continue to post them for, through tonight, through tomorrow. And then later in the show, I'll show you what you guys are going to win. So we have some cool prizes to give away to you guys. But without further ado, let's bring on the man of the hour, our good buddy Skip Martin from Romacraft. Skip, welcome to Smoke Night Live, my friends. How you doing, man? Good, man. So uh, Skip's in Nicaragua, as he normally is. And... Uh, so, hey, it was a crazy day today. Uh, from your perspective, uh, how did you feel that all went down? And what was it like watching the numbers come in and seeing, seeing your, your baby just blow out like that? <laughs> well, it was a normal day for me. I mean, I'm, I'm, I was in the factory getting ready for the trade show. We, this, the, the drama around this project for me was about three weeks ago when we didn't think we were going to get boxes. So, um, <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, so you know, I, I took a break for lunch and saw that uh, that it had already sold out. So, you know, it's always good to, uh, you know, we do we do we do pretty good. So it's it's always good to see a project sell. You know, it's more rewarding, I think, to see, uh, you know, a week from now when everybody starts getting it, people's reaction to it to it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of these limited editions come out; they're kind of uh, you know, a throwaway blend that some factory throws together. And uh, as you know, we don't do, do things that way. So uh, this product was released, you know, with the same kind of thought and effort as, as any project we do. So uh, we're really proud of it and uh, glad that it uh, did well for you guys and for Famous. Yeah, you know, uh, you make a good point, Skip. Um, there's a lot of these sort of projects that float around like this. and. Uh, but this, the ones that we try to do, the ones that we do, we don't just throw them out as quick as we can. We try to come up with, with really cool things. And when you came to us a year ago in New Orleans with this idea about Whiskey Rebellion, I was blown away because not only am I a big cigar guy, but I'm a big whiskey guy, as you know, and so are you. And so it just seemed like the perfect uh, mix, but... But not only that, the cigar itself is a really interesting blend. And maybe you can touch a little bit on uh, how you came up with it uh, as, as, as far as how you came up with this idea for Whiskey Rebellion. And then maybe you could talk a little bit about the blend itself and the cigar itself and what guys are going to expect to smoke when they get it. Right. So um, 
you know, we were we were having our uh, our annual hospitality uh, event at the uh, trade show last year, and you guys came over. <clears throat> we talked about uh, doing the next project, which I think was going to be in about seven months ago. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I said, you know, I'd like to do something with you guys, but uh, you know, it, it has to be something that we feel like is really well thought out and. We had been working on a blend uh, to do with Famous, uh, with Arthur and Errol and Jim. We've been working on a blend to do uh, for them. As you know, we uh, everything we make, we sell almost as fast as we can make it. So <clears throat> even a retailer like Famous only gets a small uh, allocation every month. So it's not even a product, even though they've always they've supported us for over a year now. It's not a product that uh, that they can put in their catalog and, and really push because by the time they it's not even worth the ink they put on the page because it's gone by the time they do that. <coughs> so um, we've been working on this idea with the FDA stuff swirling around last year of uh, of adding a new blend to the Intemperance line, and uh, we we had the blend. Uh, pretty much nailed down and the idea was is that we would extend beyond the kind of temperance and temperance prohibition era kind of idea to the idea of excise taxes and uh, and uh, you know the way the government kind of treats um, tobacco and alcohol and uh, those kinds of things so it just seemed like a really good fit to uh, you know to launch this size this uh, project with with dojo so we worked on it for um, maybe three or four months. Uh, you helped a lot with the art, which comes directly from from the uh, from the Whiskey Rebellion flag. And so we, uh, uh, I don't know, we're really proud of it. And uh, you know, I'm, you know, the fact that it sold out so fast, we probably have more kind of negative about the from the people who you know who didn't get it. So <laughs> yeah, you know, Skip. When you when people look at cigars that come out, I mean, there's a million cigars come out all the time, or hundreds, and you read the blends, and you know after a while you can start to almost predict the blends, that you know what the wrapper's going to be, what the binder's going to be. It's almost like mix and match. But I got to tell you, when I read when you told me this blend, I was like, wow, this just this just sounds friggin' amazing. It's a very unique you know, blend. Maybe you can tell a little bit about the blending process and about what this cigar is all about, you know, uh, as far as the wrapper binder filler. Right. So in Temperance has, uh, <clears throat> a Temperance has two uh, wrapper or kind of two lines, the EC uh, or the VA uh, 18. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm thrown off. The EC, which is a Ecuador, Connecticut, and the Brazil Autopodaca, which is the uh, um, the BA. So um, both of those blends are different, uh, completely different, but they're kind of fo both fall under the banner of intemperance. Uh, when we started working on this blend, um, Ecuador Habano is a, is a the Ecuador Habano special editions that we've been doing for Aquitaine have always been very uh, popular, but they're they're a little stronger. They're probably one of the strongest cigars that we make, so they're not really approachable by a lot of people. And Ecuador Habano is is a much more uh, available wrapper than, uh, say, uh, Connecticut Autoparaco or Broadleaf. So we we are able to buy a lot of that for our Aquitaine line, but we yield out some of that that is a little bit thinner. And, and a little bit lighter in color than what we use for the octane. So when we when we buy seven thousand, eight thousand pounds, we, we were always yielding about two, four hundred pounds of of the lighter leaf that didn't really work for octane. So when we started working on the new intemperance, uh, we it was a little bit different than most everything we do, which is we normally blend from the inside out, meaning we normally blend from the filler. And then we go to the binder and wrapper. And in this case, we kind of started with the wrapper. Mm. So we knew we were going to use Ecuador Habano. We, we kind of set, to, set that to the side and then started working on the, the filler elements. 
uh, around things that uh, they're a little bit harder to get than the normal normal intemperance uh, fillers, um, but they're uh, probably half of it is byproducts of things we already use in the factory, either tobacco that's a little thicker and stronger than what we normally use, or tobacco that's a little thinner uh, than what we normally use. I mean, as you know, when you buy Lajero, you get a little bit of Viso. When you buy Viso, you get a little bit of Lajero. Um, when you buy wrappers, uh, sometimes you get a little bit of binder. So um, we had this blend uh, probably about a year ago. And <clears throat> while we don't talk a lot about the 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 elements of the blend so much, uh, you know, this is Ecuador Habano, and it has tobaccos from uh, three or four different countries. And uh, it's, you know, it's just a pleasant, it's a good cigar. It actually has a lot more transitions and flavors than, than uh, a lot of our products have. Um, you know, what we generally have in our portfolio is things that taste uh, one way and they don't change a lot. This one has a little more transitions to it. So, and it's a little more in the medium range than, than a fuller body stuff that we make. So, um, you know, I started sticking these in my box here and, uh, you know, when I keep going back to them again and again and again in different sizes, I, I know that it's a it's a really good blend because, you know, obviously I can choose from a bunch of different cigars to smoke. And this is one that I've been smoking more and more. So we're really now, proud of you know, for me. Yeah, I, I, you know, with a name like Whiskey Rebellion, the cigar has to go good with whiskey. And, you right. know, this cigar goes brilliantly with whiskey. Is there a thought in your mind when you're doing this? Uh, you know that you'd want to make it pair well with bourbon kind of thing since it has that name in it or is that come to your mind at all or I mean in, in my mind almost all cigars pair well with coffee and whiskey <laughs> and so yeah. and, and water so you know that's just the nature of tobacco um, particularly the cigars that we make uh, so I mean maybe our Ecuador Connecticut is better with coffee and our Cro-Magnon is kind of better with bourbon but um, I think this is a this is a cigar that uh, you know you could probably enjoy any any point in the day, and pretty much with anything to drink, whether it's rum or whiskey or whatever. The whiskey rebellion piece of it is really more about the the politics and the history behind it and how it ties into the Intemperance brand. Sure, but at the same time, I think you might have hit on something that really goes well with with bourbon because right now I'm sitting here drinking this. Uh, fantastic George T. Stag with my Whiskey Rebellion, and it's absolutely perfect. And I know you had some some bookers down there, and that's one of my favorites too. In fact, when we met in New Orleans, uh, the funny thing was we walk in and we look on the table, and it's just loaded with craft beer and bourbon. And uh, it was like, wow, this is I'm, I know me and Skip are going to get along because this dude likes the same stuff that we do, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean. <clears throat> Particularly craft beer. I mean, here in here in Nicaragua, I smoke more rum than anything, just because good whiskey is hard to get. Um, sure. When, I, when I'm in the states nowadays, I smoke, I drink more uh, craft beer than anything because you can't get good craft beer here in Nicaragua. Um, whiskey, uh, I don't smoke, drink as much anymore because, uh, you know, my doctors told me to cut back, and you know, drinking 130 proof Booker's is probably not. <laughs> Doesn't fall under <laughs> cutting back, but, um, but but I had this bottle of twenty five year Booker's that my friend gave me, and uh, I figured this was as good of a chance as any. But I, I I poured two fingers, and I've been milking it for about an hour. So I'm not the I'm not the man I used to be, I guess. Nah, I know I got to milk it too, man. I, I'm in, I'm in the same boat you are. So all right, so hey, we've covered the whiskey rebellion pretty good, and it sold out fast. So that so this project was a smashing success. So let's move on a little bit now. Talk a little bit about what uh, Romacraft has got going on besides this. Because you guys, hey, man, I've been watching. You did the Firecracker. You've got a whole bunch of other stuff coming on that you, you did in, in Europe with the guys in Germany, right, with the, what is it, the Wonderlust. You guys right. are killing it this year. What, can, what other projects can you tell us about on the show tonight that uh, Romacraft fans might be excited to hear about? Yeah, so I can do that. Do you want to talk a little bit about the history of what the Whiskey Rebellion is? I don't know if everybody understands what that actually is. Yeah, let's do that first. Okay. Let's do that first. Hey, guys, I, I asked Skip before the show, and then I forgot because I was having so much fun talking to him. Because you had so much whiskey. That, uh, I wanted him to talk. 
Yeah, I have a little too much bourbon. I wanted him to uh, touch on the whole idea of the Whiskey Rebellion. Some people don't even realize what the Whiskey Rebellion is, and it was a major, major occurrence in the history of our nation. So I'm going to let Skip touch right. on that for a bit. It's a really interesting story. And to be honest with you, when Skip came to me and he said, hey, you know the Whiskey Rebellion, I was like, not really. So uh, after I got home from the show, I started looking into it, and it was pretty amazing. So I'll let Skip sort of touch on that, and then we'll we'll move on to other news after that. Thanks, Skip. Yeah. So the the Whiskey Rebellion uh, is it refers to a rebellion that happened in the United States, and pretty close after the uh, the War of Independence. So it, it actually ran from 1791 to 1794 when it was uh, quashed or squashed, I should say, <laughs> by. Uh, by the federal, uh, by the military. So George Washington, right? So after uh, after the the War of Independence and then and then uh, the French Indian War, there. Were, I don't actually. I don't know when the French Indian War was. I think it was. There was a war debt, and I I think it was more than just the War of Independence, but <clears throat> there was a war debt between the federal government and the states uh, that, in today's dollar, was was more than six trillion dollars. So they, what they did was, is the federal government assumed all of the uh, debt from the states, and and combined it all into one large federal debt of, of about six trillion dollars. In the in those days, it was somewhere around, uh, I don't know, seventy five million dollars. But in today's dollars, it's about uh, six trillion. So um, this happened uh, when this when this combination of all the federal debt happened. Um, Alexander Hamilton, which was the uh, Secretary of the Treasury, uh, the founder of the Federal Reserve, the founder of the Central Bank, a federal founder of the currency, uh, soon to be replaced by Harriet Tubman on the twenty dollar bill. Uh, <laughs> yeah. He he um, he proposed that that the United States issue war bonds or U.S. savings bonds in order to pay off the foreign debt, in order to uh, maintain the the credit worthiness of of the United States, this this young government. Um, so, according to Article One, Section Eight of the Constitution, they they have a right to the federal government has a right to collect debt, tariffs, uh, establish tariffs, and excise taxes. And up to that point, almost all federal debt or federal revenue was paid by uh, import and export tariffs. Uh, so, this was the first time that the federal government actually started to issue bonds. Uh, not uh, coincidentally the uh, most of the rich people in the country at that time started to buy these bonds at less than face value and in order to kind of profiteer on this this event so uh, the uh, at that point in order to start getting revenues in order to pay off and to make sure these bonds were legitimate to pay off these bonds for people who wanted to cash them in also to kind of line their own pockets um, the uh, Hamilton uh, got the Congress to push the what they called the Whiskey Act in 17 March of 1791. And what the Whiskey Act did was it put a an excise tax on uh, barrels of whiskey. So there was a, a number of things that were kind of an issue at that point. One, the grain farmers in Western Pennsylvania, which is the far western frontier of the colonies at that time, um, depended pretty heavily on whiskey because it was hard for them to transport and sell their grains on the markets. But it was a lot more uh, efficient for them to actually make whiskey from their grains and then sell the whiskey. So it particularly hit this part of Western Pennsylvania more than it hit other parts. Moreover, the uh, these small farmers were, uh, that depended really heavily on whiskey for barter and as almost as a form of currency, Almost, almost their entire revenue um, were in direct competition with large whiskey distillers in other parts of the colonies, or at this point in other states. So um, when they proposed this tax, it was originally proposed as a flat charge or as a, a, percent, a, a cost per, per gallon. And so because of the way that they worded the, uh, the law, just like the way they word laws today, it affects smaller producers a lot more disproportionately than it affected large producers. 
the smaller producers were actually paying 50 to 75 percent more tax. So these small farmers that were concentrated in Western Pennsylvania um, just said, "Screw you! We're not paying the tax." <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, the uh, the early kind of treasury agents, uh, the tax collectors, started to come to these regions and file lawsuits. And the local courts in these areas refused to force the farmers to pay these taxes. So th there was this kind of a uh, civil uh, resistance to uh, actually paying the taxes that was supported by the local governments. And this is one of the first times that these kind of local state versus federal issues started to come up. <clears throat> so um, in September 11th of, of 1792, there was actually a tax collector that was uh, uh, tarred and feathered. Uh, the whole yeah. town got together to, and that's not a pleasant thing <laughs> it, it sounds it sounds fun but uh you can imagine so actually the very first terrorist act in the united states uh was on september 11th um wow. when they when they tarred and feathered this uh tax collector yeah folks so, just think about that for a second like nowadays skip you know when you're in trouble with the irs you might get a lawyer involved you know you get your, all your documents together and try to figure it all out. But back then, man, they just tarred and feathered the guy. It was a whole different world, right. man. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, economies were much more dependent on, you know, singular things back then. And then in this area of Western Pennsylvania was very dependent on whiskey. And so um, when this happened, Hamilton convinced uh, Washington to pursue with the Congress a de declaration of, of, of rebellion. So the, the, actually the Supreme Court uh, issued a writ that said that there was actually an official rebellion that was occurring in Western Pennsylvania. So another first, um, it was the very first time they conscripted or drafted uh, members from the other states to join a, an army. Um, the army actually was about 14,000 soldiers and it was larger than any army that Washington had actually led during the War of Independence. So, Washington, again, another first, the first sitting president got on his horse in the front of this army and went to Western Pennsylvania. Uh, wow. I, can't ima I can't imagine uh, Hillary or, or Obama or, uh, or George Bush actually getting on a, a horse in the front of an army. But um, when they went to Western Pennsylvania, uh, I can was, imagine, I can kind of imagine Ronald Reagan doing that. I can kind of imagine maybe. Ronald Reagan doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he had, he had the horse for sure. Uh, so. <laughs> So um, when they arrived in Western Pennsylvania, uh, there was actually a, a war a war hero, McFarland, from the uh, the War of Independence, who was leading the re rebellion, and he was uh, basically shot off the off, off shot. He was the first victim of the war of the rebellion, and uh, uh, it ended pretty quickly at that point in 1794. So. Um, at the end of the day, there was like 12 guys that were arrested. Um, uh, two were convicted. The two that were convicted were ultimately pardoned uh, for insurrection and treason. And, um, and then it, when Jefferson was elected president, uh, he actually repealed the Whiskey Act in 1800, about six years later, saying that it was an unfair and um, uh, it was an unfair targeted tax that only affected a very small area and affected a small industry. So, um, you know, I think it's interesting. There's a lot of parallels, I think, to if you compare what happened back then to what's happening now, um, it was an ex excise tax, much less, much like the excise tax we pay on uh, tobacco that used to be used to fund the S chip. <clears throat> um, and it was the first time it was the first time that the federal government exercised its, its rights under the Constitution, uh, Article 1, Section 8, to actually uh, collect taxes uh, in that way. So fast forward to, to these, uh, you know, to the more recent times, you know, we, as an industry of tobacco, we face, you know, kind of intemp you know, temperance kind of uh, uh, movements from not from, from a lot of different whether it's insurance premiums or whether it's not no smoking laws or, or local taxes. And then we pay, we face these federal excise taxes. And then now we're facing this regulation, which is kind of this new era of, of a way to control 
um, you know, specific industries. In particular, the um, the um, the way that it affected smaller producers versus larger producers is very similar for us in terms of the way these FDA regulations are coming down uh, and affecting you know more small production cigar companies. So um, we feel like it felt we felt like it really fit in very well with this intemperance idea, with the brand, and then it was also very timely. So right, yeah, you know that's that's the most interesting aspect of it to me. Skip the parallel uh, between then and now that the larger distillers back then were not opposed to this tax because they realized they could absorb this tax and they also realized that the smaller guys couldn't absorb they couldn't deal with this tax and it was a way of uh, taking on more market share so they didn't oppose it similarly today we have uh, larger cigar companies that realize they can absorb these FDA regulations and the smaller guys can't. So to me, that's like the most interesting parallel of these two events. Yeah, it's uh, history just repeats itself, right? So <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. But either way, either way, it has, you know, at the end of the day, it's just a good cigar, but it, it has uh, it has a little bit deeper meaning. And um, uh, so, you know, we try to do that with our brands to, you know, to have them, where once you get kind of engaged with the with the cigar, you can learn a little bit more, and then um, you know, obviously, it's just like smoking cigars is a little bit deeper than just in, you know, it's a community, it's a subculture. So, right, that's, that's why it's uh, that's why we went with that. Yeah, yeah, I dig that story. I mean, uh, that's something that I don't think I don't remember in school ever hearing that story. Now, maybe I was just not paying attention. Which is very possible, but uh, I don't remember. I don't remember hearing that story in high school. We were in school a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while. We, we've we've uh, had a few uh, whiskeys since then. Exactly. So, folks, if you're watching the show right now and you have a question for Skip, post it on the dojo with hashtag Ask Dojo, and I already have some good questions. We're going to get to those here in a second, but before we do uh, get to those. Uh, Skip, maybe you can talk about the upcoming show, what uh, RomaCraft has coming up, any any exciting news or anything you can tell RomaCraft fans about what you guys have uh, coming through the pipeline. Yeah, so, you know, as a company, we don't do a lot of new releases. Um, you know, we have our, our core brands. Our core brands are Intemperance, which now has these three branches underneath it, uh, Ecuador, Connecticut, Brazil, Atapadaca, and Whiskey Rebellion. Whiskey Rebellion being the first. Uh, big expand, you know, big line that we've done in a while. Uh, we have Cro-Magnon, which has Cro-Magnon and Cro-Magnon Aquitaine. And then we have Neanderthal, um, which is currently in the core line, one, one size. And then um, for Europe, we produce a, a cigar uh, called Wonderlust. Um, and uh, so those are our four brands. Um, and so in, in five years, you know, in the first year we produced Intemperance in both wrappers and Cro-Magnet birth wrappers, it took us two and a half, three years to do Neanderthal. And then with this third, you know, with Whiskey Rebellion, it's the first, you know, kind of real new thing we've added in a while. Um, we have done sizes underneath those, those brands, um, you know, that we produce in limited numbers. We, when we produce something, we generally produce it in in, in, in a, a cycle where it's continuously produced in batches. Um, there are a few cigars, uh, very few. Uh, one example is the Firecracker we released on July 4th. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then the Whiskey Rebellion, which is, is being released on the 7th, uh, which is the, uh, the anniversary of the Whiskey Rebellion. So those, those two are cigars that probably that won't ever be made again. One was made for two guys and one was made for you. Um, as a factory, um, we do have some new things coming out. Uh, one is the, the biggest one is probably a blend that we've been working on for about three years, which is uh, Esteban's private blend, which is uh, Guaymaro. Um, it's not going to be distributed by Romacraft, it's actually going to be distributed by um, the guys at Cigar Hustler, along with Fable and Shogui. Um, but that's a great cigar. I've I've uh, I've been smoking it for for uh, 
a month and, and finally are able to post a picture of, of it today. So that's been in the pipeline for more than, uh, way more than a year. So that one is, is actually launching at this show because of the deadline, we're doing it a little bit earlier. Um, and then we have our fifth anniversary cigar coming out, which is just a Cro-Magnon cigar. It's a special size of Cro-Magnon that's coming in a, in a, uh, a package that we did with Zycar to celebrate our fifth anniversary. Um, it's a package called the Monolith that has a lighter, a, a bottle opener, a, a cutter, 10 of the anniversary cigar and a, and a ash can. And then the, the uh, the uh, box that that it comes in uh, like a travel humidor so that that fifth anniversary thing looks amazing i saw you post a picture on facebook and it looks awesome man yeah everything in there whether it's the box or the cutter or the everything in there is either something that's never been released by zycar or something that's never been released in that um finish so um everything in that box is unique. I mean, those will sell out, you know, almost immediately too. So, um, so other than those two things, uh, the factory really doesn't have much more going on. We're producing a new, uh, limited edition for a uh, Palestania. That's the, the brand that the cigar hustler guys have. Uh, it's called SBC 16. Uh, it's, it comes in a 20 count box and then we're releasing, uh, a, new version of the fable called nightshade that's uh uh it's their second line will be their last line probably <laughs> uh so, so so you know in addition to our our four lines we do palestania we do fable for uh fourth prime for fable and um so um you know it's not it's not one of these situations where we're going to come out with you know 500 new SKUs like a lot of people but uh and in every case, they're all projects that we've been working on for a while. As you know, you know we, we have a pretty long timeline for for getting things done. But um, you know, most you know most mostly what we focus on at the show is is, is spending time with the retailers because it's just Mike and I. We don't sure. really get a chance to, uh, to 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 kind of touch base with all of our retailers, uh, and this gives us the opportunity to do that once a year. So this is a. Uh, that's really what we focus on. We don't really, we're not a new product release driven company. We, we really focus on curating and, and, and keeping the consistency and quality and uh, value on the existing blends that we have. Yeah, you guys do a fantastic job of that, that's for sure. I always have uh, marveled at how the, you guys keep that quality level and the excitement and you've gone slow enough to uh, you know keep the quality way up, which is hard to do because Stuff gets popular and people want it, and all the stores want it. But you know, if you just go crazy, you might drop in quality. And you guys have never done that. You've been you've been really diligent in your efforts. So I applaud that. Hey, I got some questions okay. from the audience. So I got a lot of them. I'll try not to ask any duplicates. I'm just looking at my phone here as we go on the Dojo app. So this first one comes from Bob L. And he says, Skip, what are your business slash FDA plans post-August 8th? That's a good question. Uh, what's the vision? Uh, how are you plan on handling this? Uh, it's, it's ambiguous because we don't really know for sure what the FDA wants. So as a company, how do you guys deal with that? So, you know, we knew when we started the company. I mean, I knew when I, when I got into owning a cigar store that, that it was going to be regulated. Yeah, and then we knew when we started the company that that, that it was going to be regulated. It was uh, it was already four or five years after the Supreme Court and the Congress gave the FDA the authority over all tobacco products. So we knew it was coming. Um, we were we were we were glad that the uh, glad is maybe the wrong word. We were we were from a business perspective, we were uh, glad that that the FDA released the deeming document in May. Um, I think we're fortunate that they've given us uh, a good amount of uh, space to operate and, and make the changes. Uh, the packaging changes are a year away. The uh, the actual uh, pathways have to be completed, you know, within 30 months for a company our size. So, um, you know, they could have come out and said, "Hey, in 90 days, here's the rule," and and uh, we're glad they didn't. You know, I wish they would have given us a little more runway to to actually uh, given the the time it takes to get a new product from concept to market 
I wish they would have given us more than 90 days to, to do that. Uh, but, you know, honestly, I don't know that we would have done very much any different. We have a very developed uh, portfolio of products. They've all consistently performed and grown over the five years or since the day we released them. So um, our plan uh, from the beginning, from when we started, is to create a very lean company and to take the efficiencies and the, the, the money from the efficiencies and put it back into the quality of raw materials. Uh, we started our own little factory with the idea that we would do about a million cigars a year. Uh, we've kept very lean in Texas in terms of, uh, of, of how we operate our, our offices. Um, we don't advertise. We don't have big sales and administrative costs um, or marketing costs. So the way we've, since the day we we started, every product we've released has been prepared for regulation. In that, it's you know it's very fairly priced in the six fifty to to you know eight fifty dollar range, uh, with the exception of Neanderthal's twelve, which is it's more expensive. Um, but everything we make is a very good value and it's consistent. And if you focus on good value, quality of product and you know delivering things to you know what you say you're going to do um then we're in the same competitive marketplace as every other company so you know there are some other small companies that that have that pay factories to make cigars for them and they pay brokers to sell cigars for them and then they have to advertise to generate demand we're already at a dollar fifty two fifty four dollar advantage over those companies right so if we have to absorb a dollar or a dollar fifty in our retail prices in order to comply with the regulations. We're one of the few small companies that are in a good position to do that. Um, obviously, um, we compete against the larger companies with the quality of product and the, the engagement that we have with the people who buy our products. Um, so, to answer the the guy's question, the the way we plan on responding is by continuing to do what we do the way that we do it, mm -hmm. and um, you know, our products were all post 2007. Um, we don't plan on releasing a lot of new things after, you know, this year. So our pathway is going to be the substantial equivalence pathway. And on, you know, one end of the spectrum, the substantial equivalence pathway is going to be a, a rubber stamp that says, Hey, you have a hand rolled long filler cigar. It's like every other hand rolled long filler cigars and we'll pay, you know, a couple thousand dollars per SKU and get it into the market, uh, get it approved. Or it'll be nothing on the other end of the spectrum is nothing gets approved after 2007, in which case there'll be litigation and other things. We don't know where we're going to be on that spectrum. Um, a lot of the hyperbole about how much it costs per skew and there's never going to be a new cigar and and all that stuff. You know, we don't really buy into that. Um, but, you know, all we can do is focus on running our company efficiently and continuing to produce good products. Um, you know, the, this, Mike and I ha had this discussion about, you know, what do we plan on releasing, if anything, in the next five years? And should we kind of rush to get those things in to meet this deadline? And, you know, we both kind of felt like if our products can go through substantial equivalence correctly, then any new product we have is going to be able to get through substantial equivalence within a year or so anyway. So. Uh, should we decide we want another blend or should we decide we want another brand, then that's the path we will pursue. Mm -hmm. If if it exists, if it's true that the FDA has no intention of ever approving any new products, then um, we're going to be out of business in three and a half years anyway. So um, just keep doing things the way we do it and, until we can't do it that way anymore. So and then we'll and then we'll just sell cigars in Europe and and, you know, people who want to buy our product can order from retailers in Europe or wherever, you know. Just like they do Cuban cigars. So and th and then Skip, you know what it is is the Romacraft uh, bourbon line. That's where it comes in. <laughs> then. <laughs> well, you know, Mike and I have talked about doing a craft beer brewery in in Texas, and um, I think we both kind of decided that uh, it's just cheaper for us to buy the best beer in the world and try to figure <laughs> out how to make it, make it ourselves. Yeah. So. Not only that, but the government is after craft breweries too because they want to implement. Uh, the detailed calorie count on every release, which would be equally burdensome for uh, craft breweries. So, 
All right, here, good, good answer. Uh, this one comes, the next question comes from uh, Misal, I hope I pronounced that right, Misal D. He wants to know, Skip, besides the cigar that you make, what other small boutique cigar brands do you like to smoke and enjoy? Uh, which brands are you particularly excited about at the IPCPR? Before you answer, uh, if any of you guys follow Skip on Facebook, you'll know that Skip is very open about smoking other brands. I see you smoking Tatawahe. I see you, you were at the Drew Estate Barn Smoker. Uh, you like a whole bunch of stuff. Your palate is wide, and you're not afraid to smoke whatever is on your desk in any given day, right? Yeah, and particularly if they're free, right? <laughs> yeah, you weasel. I'm, gonna to, I'm, a, I'm the king weasel. So, um, I mean, obviously, I was a cigar smoker long before I was a retailer, and I was a, and I had lots of brands that I lo loved and supported as a retailer and as a customer. Um, that really hasn't changed. I mean, I smoke. You know, I, I still there. There are times when I go into a humidor that has five or six hundred things. And I still find myself buying my own product at full retail <laughs> just because in that particular humidor, it's what I wanted at that moment. Um, but, you know, I, I do smoke things from a lot of other people. I mean, companies like the Florida Minicana is probably my favorite, uh, you know, cigar maker. Um, I, I get a chance here in Nicaragua in particular. Uh, I mean, so when I'm in the States, if I buy things from other people, it's generally a Padron that I don't generally get to smoke or it's a Davidoff that I that I haven't seen or, or that I don't get to smoke on a regular basis or it's a, a La Fleur that I don't get to smoke on a regular basis. Uh, but here in Nicaragua, I'm pretty fortunate to, you know, we have good relationships with, with a lot of the other factories. And, you know, w whenever I go to another factory, whether it's to buy tobacco or just to visit, I generally try to weasel a couple of cigars. Um, <laughs> But you know the the um, in terms of all the things that are coming out of the show, um, AJ Fernandez and and I can't say that I love everything AJ makes, but AJ makes some things that I really do like, and um, you know everything's not made for me, so that's perfectly fine that that I'm not in love with everything that he makes. One thing that AJ has become is is a very uh, broad and deep tobacco. Uh, guy, he does a lot of pre-industry, grows his own. He acquires a lot of different kinds of tobaccos, and um, more so, I think, than a lot of factories. Uh, so we buy tobacco from AJ, and w w this, there's some stuff he won't sell us because it's it's his, and uh, that generally piques my interest. And last year, um, or I guess earlier this year at the uh, Nicaragua Cigar Festival, he gave us a cigar that was one of the best cigars I've ever smoked, probably mm -hmm. in the top top 10 and then um i believe that that blend is the bella art that he's coming out with and and i really believe it ha it's one of these cigars that probably early if i had to put odds on what the cigar of the year is going to be uh mm -hmm. this is this is probably one of those so, wow uh it was it's very very good i can't i can't there's nothing else i could say about it it's it's great so um, we were smoking. We were smoking a AJ uh, made cigar tonight, Jordan. What was that? We're reviewing it. What is it? The what? The Gran Yave. The La Gran Yave. We were smoking that earlier, made by AJ, and it was outstanding. So that was yeah. a good cigar. Yeah, he's got great tobacco, but this this particular one is one that's uh, it has a lot of unique tobaccos in it, and it and uh, it's probably the best thing I've ever smoked, you know, in Nicaragua. So it's it's great. Oh, we'll look for that one. I would look for that one. All right. This next question is from Nick L. He says, where can we get Roma Craft swag like the hat M me, like the hat I'm wearing? I don't see the store on the website. So first of all, before Skip answers, you can win these hats. It, we're giving away some of these hats in this contest. So make sure you enter the contest. We've got some shirts too. So enter that contest. But Skip. What if a guy wants one of these hats? How do they get a hold of one of these cool hats? So hats and T-shirts and those things are a huge pain in the ass. <laughs> <So> <laughs> yeah. Mike and I both almost always respond, hey, we make cigars, not shirts. And hats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I used to have a shop called Have a Cigar, which later became an online, which is where we launched Cro-Magnon. 
And then um, Angela in our office ran that for, for two years and then decided she didn't want to do it anymore. So um, we're looking at options for opening up a Roma Craft store to sell, uh, you know, bottle openers from Zycar, cutters from Zycar, um, uh, branded things like shirts and hats, uh, you know, Bluetooth speaker made out of cigar boxes, those kinds of things. I mean, our office is full of those kinds of things. So, you know, we've just been so focused on making cigars, we haven't really had time to do that. So um, it's coming uh, where where it'll be a lot easier to buy these things, but until you can buy them, you really have to kind of just up your weasel game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got to weasel it. So, uh, all right, this next question comes from Mr. Gold. He says, um, any plans to release a sampler box of all of your blends in one? So uh, is there a way guys can get a bunch of the different blends all in one sampler so they can try the different blends? Uh, do you have that available, or is that part of the plans, or no? Yeah, I mean, we've done what we call the Catadors over the years. We've done a Robusto, Panatellas, uh, Lonsdales, um, Perfectos, uh, the, the 56 Grand Robustos, so the Petit Robustos. We've done those over the years, but uh, probably, sadly, that's one of the things that will go to the side when the, you know, after August 8th. Uh, so you'll probably have, just have to go to a retailer that carries our stuff and then put your own sampler together. There we go. All right, this one comes from uh, somebody named Cigar Coop. You may have heard of him. He says, uh, why, he wants to know why. I, I heard, I heard this guy, sorry, I heard this guy's never amazed by, <laughs> yeah. the, by the stuff you did. <laughs> yeah. I like busting Coop's chops. Right. Um, he says, he wants to know why is Whataburger the best fast food hamburger in existence? You know, <laughs> I, I think fast food is an important piece of that uh, phrase. Um, if you know how to order it correctly, I think it, it's superior to most every other fast food hamburger place. I mean, there's a lot of these little kitschy, you know, uh, fancy California kind of small places that are really good. Um, Ooh, this. Well, I mean, then you got things like In and Out that are a regional thing. Um, I'm, I like. I mean, how can you not like bread, animal fat, and meat? I mean, <laughs> right. <laughs> it's kind of hard to screw up, right? But. Um, I don't know. Whataburger's a Texas thing, so I think if you're in Texas, uh, you kind of grew up with it, and just if you probably have a, a disproportionately non-fact-based, subjective, uh, I guess, uh, preference for Whataburger. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I like Whataburger. I've had Whataburger. I've had In-N-Out. They're both good, and both of those can be bad. Also, if you go to the wrong. If you go to the wrong store, they I've had bad Whataburger and I've had bad In and Out, but they're both good also if you go to the right ones. So uh, my, yeah, my, my my insider secret for Whataburger is always go for the Whataburger Junior double instead Ooh. of the Whataburger. Because for some reason in the smaller patties they they uh, taste better. So get the double Whataburger Junior, double meat, double cheese, and then skip everything except for maybe mustard, mayonnaise, jalapenos. And onions, right? And then you, you be in good shape. <laughs> Simpl si simpler is better when it comes to Whataburger, I think. Uh, you, heard it, you heard it here first on Smoke Night Live. That's how to order at Whataburger. All right. Um, this next question comes from Jerry G. I'll just try to get to the next. Let's, let's just do two more. Uh, Jerry G wants – this is a good question. Jerry G wants to know, if you could only smoke one Roma Craft cigar every day, Say you were stuck on an island, what would it be and why? Uh, it would probably be the, the the cigar I smoke the most is the the four by forty six Intemperance Autopodaca. Um, just that's the one I smoke the most. So I, I would say that that's probably um, that's probably the one I would choose. the The why is it has a lot of flavor in a small format, uh, so. When you're moving around or working, you don't. I mean, you know, our cigars burn really slow. So, you know, a cigar like, for example, our knuckle dragger still burns for an hour. So, um, you can get through a, an intrigue in 30, 45 minutes and in between whatever other activities you have going. I'll answer that one too. And it, w it would be, it's unfair of me just to say the Whiskey Rebellion because that would be my answer. So, let's just, I'll just 
move the Whiskey Rebellion out of the picture for a second. And uh, I had the revenge. And uh, it seemed like the Intemperance Revenge, uh, that was a store exclusive for, uh, let me try to remember, Doc James. Is that right, Doc James? No, the revenge is it's one of those limited ones we make and um it, I think it was our ear and uh, a cigar a cigar a, sh a shop in uh, Carolina but you know we've moved almost all of these special sizes to you know we make 100 boxes every 2 or 3 months and then when they come in whoever orders and gets them so okay uh, and and that box press in that blend it's a it's a great cigar Oh yeah for some reason I don't know why but for some reason that box press size just really hit my sweet spot and i love that cigar man i could i could smoke that every day for the rest of my life and be a happy camper okay last question from the dojo community i've got about eight more but i got we got to wrap this up so uh this one comes from kentucky colonel and this is an interesting question skip he says uh do the memories of cigars you have smoked in the past play a part in developing the the new blends that you make. In other words, are you building on new blends or do you just start from scratch each time? Well, I mean, I think you start from scratch in the sense that um, you don't really know what the makeup was of, of the other blends. And, and you know, certainly, I, mean, <clears throat> I can tell you every cigar that we make is either something that I didn't come up with or it came from something that I had smoked before. Like our Brazil Autocolaca blend really came from a, a kind of a, a bunch of events but but really what i liked about it the most was uh or what i kind of started from from my only experience with autopodaca was the toronto 50 year uh 1959 50 years which was the only brazil autopodaca cigar that i knew uh, other than the cao one that it was one that i really really liked so um the connecticut was something that esteban completely came up with on his own the uh, Cro-Magnon came from, from a cigar that I used to sell that I would get from Camacho. The Aquitaine was kind of uh, a little bit of a different version that, that was kind of more inspired by maybe the Hoya Antonio uh, Dark Corojo. Mm. Um, the uh, Neanderthal pretty much was almost completely inspired by trying to get something like the original Antonio or the uh, La Flor Double Ajero. Um, the Wonderlust. Uh, came from some cigars that I smoked while I was in Europe from the Schuster family. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think you're influenced by tobacco. Um, and, you know, everything we make is we make stuff that we like. And, then, you know, we smoke as much as we can. And then, you know, we sell what's left over. So, right. Um, but, yeah, of course, it's all inspired. There's nothing, there's, you know, I didn't, I didn't, my grandfather was not a, a tobacco plant. I didn't come from three generations of cigar makers. <laughs> um, you know, I, you know, I'm not Cuban. I'm not Latin. So, uh, you know, we just come from a place where we're just cigar smokers. And then, you know, the more I've learned about tobacco, the more I've been able to translate my passion for what I like to smoke into something that you can produce and sell at a fair price and make the same way again and again and again. Yeah. You know, like uh, some people always ask the question like, uh, you know, will, will there ever be a time when every melody for a song is already completed? And it doesn't seem like that's the case. There's, uh, there's an infinite amount of melodies for songs. Is there an yeah. infinite amount of melodies for cigars? I don't know. I don't think so. I think to, you know, there, there's no tobacco from Mars, right? right. I mean, all, all the tobacco comes from a very small group of, of, of a limited number of the tobacco genus, you know, that can actually be made into long filler cigars. Um, you know, the more prosperous that, you know, we're just, I guess we're pretty lucky that it just so happens that the places where tobacco grows the best are also places that are not very economically developed. Mm. And, and I don't say that in a negative way. I mean, I, you know, if, if Nicaragua became as successful as the United States, if the Dominican became as successful as the United States, um, I would be really happy for the people of those countries. But 
making cigars there probably wouldn't be possible anymore. So uh, at least not the way we make them now. So right. it's just a weird thing where these, you know, equatorial kind of uh, countries that are, that grow in this range uh, of latitude where tobacco grows really well, um, just to also so happen to be places where you can make cigars in a co cost effective way. Um, uh, and grow tobacco uh, in a cost-effective way. Uh, you, you know, the the importance to the economy in Nicaragua of tobacco exceeds the political correctness of growing tobacco as a crop. So, um, in that way, we're really lucky that. Uh, you know, I wonder if the Spanish had never been in Cuba, uh, if they would have developed the tobacco industry there, and if and if Cuba hadn't had the political problems it had, if we would have ever really developed the tobacco industry in Nicaragua, uh, uh, we wouldn't have probably. We probably would all still be smoking Cuban cigars. And I think uh, tobacco has a long history that is very tied into a lot of things that happen uh, have, have happened in the last four or five hundred years. And um, I think it'd be a real shame if uh, if things in in the in the regulations in the United States. Uh, change you know became the next inflection point in the history of tobacco yeah all right so uh dojo i hope you enjoyed the show before we go uh we have this contest going on and the contest is how do you fight for your rights and so the hashtag is <clears throat> hashtag rebel and we've got a lot of good entries we're not going to pick any winners tonight but i wanted to show just a few good entries to give you, give you guys a flavor for what's going on so uh, we're going to go through uh, six or eight entries real quick, and I'll show you guys, and I'll show Skip. And uh, you can enter this contest all the way through tomorrow night. We'll be giving away these cool hats. We'll be giving away some shirts, and there might be some uh, Whiskey Rebellion uh, Segundos, so seconds that Skip gave me, and we'll, we'll give away a couple five-packs of those as well. Uh, there's a cool ashtray in here. Uh, we got some awesome prizes, so just keep entering until tomorrow night. We'll have some fun. But here's here's a couple of uh, here's a couple of the entries that we liked so far. Now, remember, uh, I had to get these entries before the show started, so there's probably been some better ones or, or some good ones since. But uh, here's one from uh, George C. and uh, he says, "I fight for my rights by creating more like us to defend our constitution." Boston Tobacco Party, and that's pretty cool. He's got a uh, Looks like some sort of state trooper hat there. So uh, thanks, George, for that. Thanks for your service. Uh, this one comes from Keegan Jim. He says, I'm smoking a Roma Craft on the job. So uh, this is how he rebels. I dig that. Thanks, Keegan Jim. We had a good time with him in uh, New Orleans. He came and visited uh, us in New Orleans when we were having some fun last year. This one's from Tom R. He says, uh, I haven't smoked one of these grocery store cigars in months, but I will tonight. Why? You ask, because I'm a rebel, and that's how I roll. Thanks, Tom, for that. That's kind of funny. I haven't smoked a grocery so, store cigars for uh, years. So, Eric, is that is that when uh, keeping it real goes wrong or keeping it rebel goes wrong? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Who knows what happened after he lit that thing up? Uh, yeah. This one comes from Trojan Man. He says, uh, we must all rebel. So he's got uh, – James Dean there on a motorcycle. That's pretty cool. He's got Roma Craft in there. He's got a Whiskey Rebellion box in there. Save the Leaf logo in there and a Dojo logo. That's pretty cool. Thanks, Trojan Man. This one comes from Twisted Hops. He says, uh, I fight for my rights by rolling and smoking my own handcrafted cigar. Good for you, brother. That's awesome, man. What do you think about that, Skip? A dude just rolling his own stuff. That's cool. It's a lot of work, man. <laughs> <laughs> but good. I think if you become the best in the world at doing that, you can make about four hundred dollars a month. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good job, brother! Or, or you could save about four hundred dollars a month. I guess yeah, you right. That way. This one comes from Mawate. He says, "I swear, I thought it was an FDA building." <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh, good job, Mawate. Thanks for that entry. This one comes from Brad for, from Tampa. He says. Mm -hmm. I'm a loner, Dottie. A rebel. He's got the cigar in Pee Wee's mouth. And not to be outdone. The Pee Wee meme. You don't see those often. We have a battle of the Pee Wees here because uh, a huge nerd also had that same idea. 
except he put his face on there. That's also funny. Thanks, brother. A huge nerd. Mm -hmm. uh, this one comes from – we have a couple from Donald. Uh, this one's uh, with a rebel yell. She cried, do, jo, do, or jo, 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 something like that. Thanks, Donald. That's funny. Billy Idol there. Uh, this is also from Donald. You got to fight for your right. There's uh, the uh, – The Beastie Boys. The Beastie Boys, except for it's Jordan, me, and Jack on there. That's hilarious. And nice. he's got – He's got the flag in the background. We don't know who made that flag, do we? Do we? Do we know who made that flag? Some West Western Pennsylvania farmer, I yeah. assume, or his wife, more likely. That's a sweet flag. <laughs> so cool. All right, and then we got uh, Fire B says he's a real rebel. He says I left the seat up, smoking in the house, and pairing with a Bud Light because I'm the king of the castle. Uh oh, here come here she comes. Be cool. <laughs> so uh, he, a, he got no fucks. That's no fucks given. He's got he's got an ashtray in his bathroom. Right, exactly. <laughs> and this this one, I think this is the last one. This is from Chris F. He says, I'd smuggle as many cigars as I could. <laughs> he's got the x-ray going there. So uh, thanks guys for that. I'd probably keep I'd probably keep him in a cello in that situation. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, cello <laughs> that for sure. So uh, so keep those keep those entries coming, guys. And uh, those are hilarious. Like I said, we'll pick the winners, Jordan, on Saturday. Jordan, pick the winners on Saturday? Saturday-ish, yeah. Saturday we'll pick the winners. So just keep them coming. We're going to give away a bunch of stuff, have some fun. I want to thank, first and foremost, I want to thank Skip and Michael, and I want to thank the guys from Famous, Jim, Errol, Jenny, uh, Ryan. All those guys did a, a fantastic job today with this sale. There's no way in the world that something like today would happen without a a quality cigar and i can't wait till you guys get this thing because this whiskey rebellion is everything that we said it was and more you're gonna love it and so i want to thank uh first of all skip and michael and then i want to thank the guys for famous because man that sale was it went as smooth as butter it was really incredible we just had such a fun time today skip i just uh i just can't thank you guys enough no, thank you. Um, you know, we're glad to kind of be in this. We might be the very last Cigar Dojo <laughs> yeah. uh, limited release. So, Yeah, it was amazing, man. We had such a great time today getting up early and just uh, getting it all started and watching it go. It was just so much fun. And the Dojo community is so supportive, but uh, it doesn't happen without a great product. So uh, we can't thank you guys enough. And, hey, I can't wait to see you in Vegas, Skip. We're going to hang out in Vegas and have some fun. The dojo party is Monday the 25th. And so all dojo members are invited to that party. If you're a dojo member, go to Enfuego on July 25th at 7 p.m. You get in the door. You can get some good cigars. Skip will probably be there. And then the next night, we're gonna probably going to go hang out with Skip at his place. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, and then I'll have a, a new baby on uh, so I'll be glad to uh, get 10 days away. <laughs> That's right. Congratulations on that new baby, brother. Oh, uh, Thanks, brother. All right. So, hey, guys, tonight's just young. Let's uh, drink some good whiskey, smoke some good cigars, and be excited about the whiskey rebellions that are coming in the mail, like little Christmas presents to all of us in the next couple days. And uh, so uh, remember, never smoke alone. See you guys next week. Thanks, brother.